Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it, wherever you are. And Shalom, and welcome to Maka Fleischer. Hello. And Shalom, and welcome to our show. We have a very interesting show, Bezrat Hashem, with the help of God. We have a lot of interesting stuff on the show. Uh, we have Ben Bresky with a history moment. That's going to be very interesting. I think about uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, because we're celebrating 100 years uh, since the passing of the uh, one of the main catalysts, catalyzers for the resurgence of the Hebrew language. Ben Bresky, he's got a, he's got a, a history moment for us about that. And you and I visited um, our son's school. They had a whole event in the school. Like the school was like turned into Decorated, a Hebrew, right? right into, a, into a celebration of Hebrew. Um, that's really cool. And the main phrase there was this phrase that said there's really two things that kept the Jewish people going throughout the ages, and that's the Hebrew language and the land of Israel. Those are two things. Now, the Hebrew language, you may say, well, where's Torah? Well, that's exactly where Torah is. Torah is in a language. It's in Hebrew. So Torah, the teachings of Torah and the language of Torah are really one. Uh, They're really one thing. So whenever you want to understand Torah on a deeper level... And the Torah was meant to be carried out in the land of Israel. That's right. Uh, it knows how to be carried out uh, in, in the diaspora and around the world as well. Yeah, very much so. But it's it's heart and center, its deepest expression uh, is in the land of Israel. And so now we're celebrating Eliezer ben Yehuda's life who you know helped the resurgence uh, of Hebrew and helped defeat other languages that were vying for supremacy within the Jewish world, like Yiddish and like German. Right. Uh, and today, by the way, there's a, there's a new battle for Hebrew because there's a lot of English creeping in. Right. Even into signs and right. stuff like that. And it brings with it its culture. Right. The, the language brings with it its culture. Yeah. So, for example, here we are speaking English, and, and we we are also infused with a hefty helping of Western culture as a result of that. And part of the battle for developing the state of Israel um, is vying for its culture and trying to help the Jewish people to... Um, return to their unique original culture, which is a which is no small task at all, as we try to uh, wade through two thousand years of diaspora. Well, it's a tricky thing, really, about about being Jewish, because on the one hand, there's no question that there's an element of uniqueness, like this is a uh, this is a set apart people, a set apart land, and you're supposed to have an element of uh, a, a nation that dwells alone within morality and within its laws, so it dwells alone. On the other hand, it is obvious that Hashem put the Jewish, the, the, the Der Judenstadt, the Jewish state, originally right in the heart of the whole world uh, before you know the new world was discovered. Israel was really in the center of, of all things and, and the crossroads of civilizations and the crossroads of trade. And the reason I say that is because um, and Jews have always been involved in the world. And so the other side of the dichotomy is that the Jews are always worldly, always right. international, uh, and, and always involved in other things. So, and, and if you look at the Torah, the Torah kind of says, yeah, your nation d- dwells alone, but then it says on the other hand, you're also representative of all nations. There's an element right. of you that, that represent, you stand, your 70 original souls stand for the uh, 70 original nations, and so there's there's an element of of actually always being international and always being connected to the world. So this, that's an irony. And that's what the show is about. In part, the show is about the real Israel, but sending that story out I- into the world. That's why we do it in English. Uh, so that that that's an interesting dichotomy. Speaking of a, a person who was like uh, so Eliezer ben Yehuda, he he actually was incredibly insular, like totally xenophobic in his cultural crusade if i may borrow a cultural term um to bring back hebrew like he didn't let his kids play with other kids so that they wouldn't be infused with their languages he wanted to develop a nucleus of hebrew speaking peoples and so he was extremely vociferous about fighting for just hebrew and and for perfection in hebrew uh, right making sure the univer- israeli universities were not teaching in german for example that's right that's right, and he fought that battle and won it. And, uh, and there were other people down the line, for example, later on, uh, Jabotinsky would give us public speeches in Hebrew to, to huge audiences that knew not a word of Hebrew. <laughs> and he would just get up there and be like, 
Four blah, score blah, and seven blah, blah, years blah. ago, you yeah. know, and he would give a whole speech in Hebrew, and uh, and people would be like, uh, but that was one of the efforts of the time to really to really uh, stake out the place of Hebrew, uh, you know. It, as, we need as, to we need to return to that a tiny tiny bit here in Israel. That's what I think as well. That's what I think as well. Like it, we can't ignore the fact that there are serious advantages to all the various languages that we speak, and we should continue to speak those languages. It's not like we need to eradicate the memory of those languages from off our land or something. Like you have to be able to work in the platform of this earth. At the same time, there's like the infusion of especially English into Hebrew and all the like huge amount of cultural weight that that brings. Right. It's like um, Greece. needs to it's be like, like shaken and off. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's like the power of Greece and Rome. It's like there's these other cultures. And so it's a balance. It's a it's a real balancing act. And we 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 fight that balance in our very house uh, here uh, in, uh, in in Gush Etzion in Judea. Where there's a lot of English, it's tough. It it's, is. A, it is tough. We, and, I don't know if we're winning. It's a. It's a tough battle. It is a tough battle. And yesterday we actually went to um, here in Gush Etzion to to a group of people who are who are kind of creating a club, which is a very Anglo centered club for kids, and it's really nice with great values. But I just was like, I chafed. Right, the, the Englishness is like. I chafed at it. I was just like. I don't know if I want my kid to go to because a, you can feel that it brings with it all. It's not just the language, like the here we are speaking the English language with you right now. It's not that the English language is evil, by far not, but it does have there's there's so much culture behind it, and you don't always want to be involved in that. You want to be involved in a more Jewish culture, a more Hebrew culture, a more Eretz Israel culture, right? That to me, that's the it's the second part. I'm less concerned with the influx of the foreign culture. I'm more like, am do do my kids have a strong Hebrew culture? And I feel that they don't a lot of times. Uh, and that that always and I'm jealous of the uh, the people that I work with sometimes that are that have a strong Hebrew culture. And I see that their kids flourish because it is more organic to be in that Hebrew culture with this land. And I just I just see them being successful in that sense. And so I'm always jealous of that. I want to strengthen them. We actually have Hebrew tutoring for our kids. Even though our kids were born in Israel. Born in Israel, but they but they have lived in a, within an Anglo sphere. Uh, and and I, I, I'm happy that we have this like strengthening. And I by the way, the kids, I, I'm very happy to see that they are not at all rebelling against that. They're like, Good. I just wonder if they're, it's actually working. It, it it works. It it works on whatever level it works. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's like in a video game. It's like do 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 do. Just a little bit more power means. You know, a it lot. used to be that in the especially like the early '90s and for sure in the '80s and '70s, when Jews would co- make Aliyah from America, they would abandon English. Yes, that's right. And they would marry like local Israelis. No, they would even marry. No, they would marry Anglo's, but they spoke to their kids in in Hebrew. I mean, I don't uh, the the people. For, I can't think of anyone that I know who who is two Anglo people married who speak Hebrew in the house. Hillel and Bina Fendel, Uri and 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 uh, uh, and, and Shelley Carson, no, et cetera, et cetera. That's, I could that's give you, true. I could that, give those you are two good those. examples. Yeah. But the examples I'm really thinking of are other people that I've met along the way who made Aliyah. They married like a, a native Israeli. And then they, that's it. Like they never spoke English to their kids. Their kids don't really speak English. I, yeah. I, I know, I know, I know all different kinds. There's different kinds. But uh, the bottom line is that today, the today big, that is not, that is big, not considered a the value. The big difference is the internet. The internet. That is the big difference. Even when I was here in Yeshiva uh, for, for my, for, for, and ended up being four years with Yeshiva in the army, there was no way to even imbibe American culture. I remember that I had a radio tuner and from time to time we would get Jordanian radio and Jordanian radio would play Western music and, right, it would and be like, like oh. it would be like, oh my God, a little Bon Jovi there. Oh my God, you know? <laughs> and it was it was just like a taste. Right. And it, they would be like, and and now we are going to play one of our favorites from uh, Bon Jovi. Right. And this is a dedication to Ahmad al Living Shukira. on the prayer. Yeah, but they would be like, and they were also dedicated uh. to somebody. She, it's like, Ahmed is dedicating it to, to whatever, to Fatima from uh, Amman. And here is Bon Jovi living on the prayer. 
And it would be like that. We'd be like, yes. Yeah, because after so long, you finally like encountered something right, recognizable because... from the foreign country that you came from. Right, that's right. Well, Ishai, speaking of the internet, that's a really funny segue that you didn't even realize you were making. I have such a weird little news item for you. Go. From Calculist. Calculist, it's, a, it's an Israeli uh, financial paper. Right, which is this. Report. According to the Global Internet Value Index... Israel has the world's best value for money for internet. What does that mean? I don't know. It says the index was created by ranking 117 countries and territories based on the speed to affordability ratios of fixed broadband internet and mobile internet. Oh, so we're so we're we have we have value, we have fast internet relatively and at a good price. At a good price. We we actually you and I we but isn't that funny of the world? Yeah, that that is funny. A little surprising. Some, to yeah, me. it is surprising. Given I'm surprised. I would think some European countries. I would think the United States. The United States is eh when it comes to internet. It's 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 okay. It's good, but it's not like it's not like it's not like like some parts of it are like a little a little slow to to totally wire and develop and make everything fast. Although I by the way I've seen a, a big change and I think that uh, today's uh, service in in America is very good. But but. Uh, that's interesting that you say that. We, we actually recently got got uh, fiber optic in in the house, and it really has sped up things, and that's been a lot of fun. And we we switched companies, and we found a better company. It uh, says here that the index has marked Israel with a certain score, which is nine times higher than the global average. Wow! Meaning Israelis get their internet for a much fairer price compared to other countries. Okay, well, Baruch Hashem. That is nice to know that there's something that we yeah, are getting cheaper. That, right. <laughs> Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot of stuff do we get cheap around here. That's For a true. second, it was eggs. You guys in the United States, I know, and around the world are like sweating over your eggs. Eggs became really expensive. Baruch Hashem. You know what else is... is but Israel uh, and Israel for a second, our eggs were not so expensive. Fertility, and we're just like, oh. Fertility treatment. Israel right. for, is, Israel's much cheaper. Well, it's subsidized. For, subsidized, that's right. Uh, so Baruch Hashem for that. So you can have your eggs and your fertility and your internet and then and, and that way you grow. And of course, oh, you know what else is really cheaper here? Uh, uh, speaking to God is like a local call around here. You just kind of like turn your eyes up to the heavens and you're like chatting with the Lord. It's like you could feel it. It's a, it's a local call around here. Well, another good piece of news out of Israel actually um, is that according to a poll measured by Gallup by an organization called Hologic, the 2021 Hologic Global Women's Health Index ranked Israel as the ninth overall in women's health in the world. Mm-hmm. The Israeli women are the ninth healthiest in the world, and this and it says here second for life expectancy. Right, that's a known thing. Israelis have long life. True, true, true. Uh, and and that's and even with some of the horrible uh, obstacles we face in terms of security. Yeah, no, but but that those are Baruch Hashem small numbers. The the big numbers are people living and dying and. And we have we have a, lot, a high life expectancy, and I think you could you could chalk it up to the Mediterranean diet, or you could chalk it up to this and that. But I really think that it's it's Mishamayim. I think it's from Hashem. You know, he he gives us uh, you know our full life here. Um, the show, but so we just started telling you, Malka, that the show has Ben Bresky's uh, history moment. We also have Maurice Hirsch, uh, who is an advocate, who is a lawyer, and also uh, the head. Uh, of judicial advocacy or something like that for Palestinian Media Watch or judicial activism. I don't know. Um, in any case, he talks about the problems of the prisoners in Israel, the terrorist prisoners, and uh, also talking about the uh, political party that I'm involved in, which is uh, the Otsma Yehudi Party uh, under the leadership of Itamar ben and talking about some of the things that are being that are that are that are being pushed along right now Malka and just two little things have been have been propelled in the last few days yeah one shutting down here this is going to sound like a like a weird thing shutting down two bakeries within the prison system the former terrorists the the terrorists the, the, the yeah but the terror convicts the security convicts they're running inside the Israeli prisons a pita bakery a pita bakery that they that the prisoners bake pitas, and then and, they hand them and, out. And hand them other. out, yeah, and so they can have fresh pizza because nothing like you starting. Don't want, your, you don't want to be suffering. Yeah, you don't want to start your, your prison morning without with, some with fresh pizza. Right, you know that's provided from the outside, and I, like 
First thing is, what? Yeah. There was a pizza bakery for for the people who murdered Jews. That's that's number one. Number two is that 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 there's a concerted effort by by Minister Ben Gvir to uh, close the what he calls like camp like atmosphere in these prisons where you're just basically lounging lounging around and and uh, my good friend Jake sent me an article about a, a Arizona sheriff a retired Arizona sheriff the head of like the the whole, I forgot his name but the the head of the prison services there that he made prisoners like wear ridiculous clothes like these like pinkish he's like he's like no you shouldn't wear these like orange jumpsuits and feel good about right like, feel like a tough guy right no yeah, yeah you're, you're a pretty little lady yeah <laughs> Uh, but the, the the point is is that that Ben Fear is like this is wrong. These people did a really bad thing, and 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 what we should have is the death penalty for them. But 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 in absence of that, like yeah, it, it, prison is not supposed to be fun, right? Prison is not supposed to be is not supposed to be like okay. If I kill these Jews, worst comes to worst, I get shot. But if I if I don't get shot. Then I'll make it to prison. If I make it to prison, that just means right, that I'll, I'll study, I'll hang, hang out, with, yeah, hang out with with fellow. There's, eat, there's eat, my eat wife will pizza. visit me anyway. Right. So that's not right. That is not right. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Minister Benfier went into uh, went into the um, office that gives you permits to get a gun license. Mm-hmm. That gets you give the gun license office. Yeah. And there's like a huge backlog. There's like 17,000 people in From backlog. last year. Like it's a huge backlog. And he of, asked, of how many people a day do you guys clear? They're like four. Four? Yeah. They're like four. And he's like, I'm going to shut this whole thing down. Today he announced that they are doubling that office's capacity and blah, blah, blah. no not like the, the amount of workers and he just uh, said, uh, uh, they're going to they're going to be being more serious about yeah, it. Yeah, get get going. Let's go. Yeah, it could be no. The answer could be no, but at least be processing people's uh, right. applications. And, th- and this is in the wake of a horrific terror attack that struck yes. Israel uh, Friday night, and uh, and basically seven Jews uh, were were killed, murdered in uh, North Jerusalem, in Neve Yaakov. In a r- very religious neighborhood. Very religious neighborhood. They were outside of a synagogue. They were shot. Sadly, there wasn't there weren't weapons in these people's hands. Um, and that is, of course, a big mistake. You got to have guns, uh, because because the guns in the last many terror attacks, the large majority, the overwhelming majority of terrorists have been stopped by civilians, civilians. with guns, and that's just like right, a, or off duty soldiers. Right. Well, that's just, but everybody, every civilian. I'm just saying it's people. It's yeah. not like a police officer right. or like a soldier who's standing guard somewhere. Right. It's it's, it's like people walking that's right. around. That's right. That's right. And it's very important. It's very important, and it's part of the Israeli ethos. Right. It's part of. It's not. It's part of being an Israeli. Part of being an Israeli is having a gun, you know, and and shooting the bad guy dead. All right, so so that's that, and you know what else? So we have Maurice Hirsch talking about the prison uh, prisoners and and their situation. We By the way, have... we still have injured from the terror attack this last week. Yes, and everybody should be praying. That's right. We have we have a guy. We have we have an officer from a from a different attack, right? Uh, that because there was actually four attacks in the same day. Nadav Chaim Ben Irit Chaya. He should have a refuah lema. And he he actually was shot in the stomach. He shot back. That's right. And he stopped this thirteen year old with a gun. Yeah, thirteen year old with a oh gun. Oh my god! That's another thing. That's another thing. You got to put the right. You got to put the guns in the right people's hands. You got to take away the right. guns. Well, there's a huge, huge black market of of weapons in the Palestinian that's right. Authority. Not just the, also in Israeli Arab cities. Right. Um, okay, so that's that. And then we're going to have Rev Mike Foyermark, and we're going to talk about the man. And Haman. That's what that. That's what the, That's what that part of the show is about. It's about. Nice. It's about the mana and Haman. The mana and Haman. That's what. That's that's what it is. And there's a relationship between those two things, uh, the bread of faith, and uh, the uh, the bread of uh, heavenly food, and uh, very Our earthly enemy. Yes. enemy that that comes from the from the nether world. Okay. So we're going to talk about really re- faith v- versus nihilism. And uh, and as as uh, understood in this week's Torah portion, Maka. One more thing today is that today um, um, is also the memorial day for Ilan Ramon, right? Uh, who was one of Israel's great fighter pilots, who uh, fought in, uh, in the Osirak bombing in in Iraq, and then uh, blew up 
sadly was Israel's first astronaut, and then and then uh, when the Columbia shuttle re-entered, uh, it uh, it was destroyed over Texas, I think. Um, right. And uh, sadly, uh, sadly, we lost Elon Ramon. Uh, his son was also lost in a jet fighting training accident. And now today we have a beautiful new airport named after the the uh, the, the Ramon family down in the south, uh, which is which is uh, which is really cool. So, you know. Um, flight is its own huge world, the world of aviation. I happen to have an interest in it. Sadly, since I'm colorblind, I really have no uh, no chance to 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 ever be a pilot in any way. But I have been on a lot of airplanes, a lot of choppers too. I've if been... you had the chance to go to space, would you go? Not as the pilot. Heck yeah, I would go too. <laughs> I would go too. I because I know there's some people who are like no. They're like afraid of that kind of thing. I would go. Oh, I would go. I would go in a second. But I've but but unlike you, I've you, have you ever been in a chopper, Malka? No, I'm actually much more afraid of going in a chopper. There's nothing like in, helicopters. Nothing I'm really like afraid it. of that. It's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. And I've been quite a few in the army. I really spent a lot of time in the helicopters, uh, which is cool, right? I, yeah, I got, got to do a lot of helicoptering in jeeps and cool stuff like that. So anyway, uh, you know, America uh, is really the pioneer of aviation the united states really the number one there's others but really the real the real aviation started in the, in the united states and but israel quickly uh you know since its formation you know has really 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 invested in flying a lot um and we have drones and we have missiles and we have a great air force and we have you know great jet pilots and all that kind of stuff and so and of course we have the great el al and so uh, today, I guess I guess today is like a day to also not just think about um, uh, Ilan Ramon, but also to think about uh, Israeli aviation. So that's also something today. And a little another s- sad piece of news. Lastly, is that um, there was a uh, you know months ago there was this ma- this this axe massacre in uh, in Elad. Right. This was months ago. Nine months ago. Uh, now for the last nine months. Uh, a man, Shimon Ma'atuf, 75 years old, uh, has been fighting for his life for the last nine months. Nine months! Nine months! It's a long time. And to succumb to his injuries today really breaks your heart. Really breaks your heart. But here's the good side of it. He uh, leaves behind a wife, six children, and 13 grandchildren. That's nice. Um, It's terrible. It's terrible. So we we will... uh, We will... uh, he was serving as a security guard at the entrance of the park, not from, from where the attack occurred. When he heard the screams, All right. he left his post, and it was then the terrorists spotted him, began to don't, attack. Don't read it too harshly. The kids yeah. listen to this show. Yeah. So anyway, he... he, he uh, yeah. Uh, so we will light a candle for him today, and uh, and Bezrat Hashem, his, his strength and, and his family continues to, to survive him. And, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the challenge of, of Israel continues continuously and uh the the fight is still on for der judenstadt the jewish state it's it's still on uh and we have ups and downs um and uh hashem you know he sees his loved ones and he remembers their souls um and may uh may may the the neshama of shimon ma'atuf find rest and peace and completion um and uh, his his sacrifice you know may give give us strength amen and that's that's the fight here for israel that's the that that's the continuous fight so Malka, we have a we have a long uh, and illustrious show up ahead uh and i want to thank you very much for being with us but before i let you go Malka, i do want to thank also the folks that make this show happen including the good folks at prohibition pickle and maybe we should make some kind of order we have some special guests this show but right. maybe we should make a, a little bit of an order uh, from prohibitionpickle.co.il uh, and you can make an order as well. There's a lot of yum yums over there. Holy yum yums. That's right. Holy yum yums. That's actually, if I would make a competing chain of, <laughs> I would call it holy yum yums. That's what mm. I would call it. But I'm not going to make a competing chain. No. And so therefore, I let Prohibition We're pickle that soon. Only. That's right. Uh, Maka, another piece of news is that the uh, Isha Fleischer Israel podcast is now part of the JNS.org wow, family. That's right. Alto. That's right. That's right. So so my podcast is now featured on, uh, this podcast is featured on JNS.org, which is a wonderful, maybe one of the best news outlets out there today. Uh, and uh, the Ishai Fleischer Show is very, very proud to now be on JNS. 
Uh, Which is a real up and coming news website. No doubt. No doubt. Definitely is. And nationalist by its nature. Um, and very important way to, very important prism through which to see the reality of Israel today. And uh, that joins the other network that we're on, the other uh, news outlet that we're on, which is JewishPress.com. They put out a great email every single day, JewishPress.com. Together with JNS.org, you will be covered. Yeah, you got it all. You got, you'll understand what's going on around here and, and just and have fun reading it because it's more of a perspective of a strong and, and, and successful Israel. So those two websites. Uh, and also our good friends at Retro Watch Guy. That's right. I'm wearing right now my Tissot. Really nice. I'm wearing it right now. Um, looking, it, looking spiffy. That's right. Looking spiffy and yet retro. Okay. Yeah. And yet retro. You're like interesting. Like, yeah, I want to have a conversation with that guy. Yeah, that guy's cool. I look at people in the Knesset. I'm like, what, what watch are you wearing? What, what, what cool stuff are you got going on? Uh, so that's that's fun. So check out retrowatchguy.com and let me know if there's any cool watches that you're interested in or put on coupon code Yishai. Bang. Uh, you get percentage points off there. Uh, and uh, and when you're when you have your watch on your hand, another thing that's really fun is to open up that Bible, uh, the Israel Bible. Hold on to it. Be like, I have a half hour. Yeah, that's right. I have time. I have time for, for Hashem. And so you go to theisraelbible.com, order yourself a beautiful English, Hebrew, transliteration, translation, great commentary specifically about the land of Israel, uh, and a beautiful cover. That's theisraelbible.com. And don't be a friar. That means don't be a sucker. Get a few percentage point, points off of that, of God's holy word, by typing in, typing in coupon code Yishai. Bang. There you go. Bang. Uh, and of course, Malka, uh, how could we uh, go on without talking about the heartland itself? And I got two heartland places for you. One is the Jewish community of Hebron, where yes. I work. I'm very proud to serve uh, as a spokesman for that town. Check out hebronfund.org. Keep the forefathers and mothers strong, and you will uh, you will be blessed. So that's hebronfund.org. Uh, and check out our tours with the uh, immutable Rabbi Simcha Hachbaum. Uh, the hebronfund.org forward slash tour and of course when you go to land of Israel don't forget the heart of the heart which is the temple mount that's right so go to the high on the har.com website high on the har h-a-r at the end there and uh, they will take you up they will tour you and you will come down with a spiritual suntan the likes of which you've never had before because you have connected put your finger on the heart of the heart and before a temple is built get it now because later there's going to be a temple there and there's going to be a lot more you know there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a lot longer lines basically. I yeah. Think. So so get in early, grab yes. it. You know, go up in holiness. That's right. And prepare according to the laws. That's right. High in the heart, we'll guide you, we'll direct you, and we'll inform you, and we'll bring you to God's holy mountain. That's pretty cool. So that's the folks that support the show, Malka, and of course uh, the folks that support the show are are folks like like you guys out there uh, who are who make all the difference and are connected. So please. Uh, let other people know about the show by giving us a high, high amount of stars, five stars if you don't mind, uh, on your podcast systems. Share it and write a comment. Write a tiny comment like "Yay!" and that was that's already winky face. That's right, winky face will already will already help the cause. Uh, we have a great show uh, coming up right now. Uh, let's go to Maurice Hirsch uh, and his explanations. This is be great. It's I sat at the Knesset with Maurice and we talked about uh, prisoners. Uh, and how Israel needs to deal with them. Here we go. Mako, thank you very much, and Shabbat thank Shalom. Thank you, Shabbat Shalom. All right, folks, Yishai Fleischer here. I'm at the Knesset, and of course, the Knesset, you meet all kinds of awesome people who are pushing ahead. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we talk about, but when it comes down to, to the things that we talk about and turning them into brass tacks, uh, that happens through the legal means. And Maurice Hirsch, uh, who's a former lieutenant colonel in the Israeli army uh, in the JAG Corps, and uh, today the head of legal strategies for Palestinian Media Watch, uh, palwatch.org, a very important uh, website that I follow closely to understand what's going on in the uh, Arab mind, in the Arab street, and certainly not in the, just in the Arab street, but in the jihadist elements of the Arab street. And the reason I say that is because, you know, uh, when we say Arab Street, we don't mean every Arab, but we are talking about that battle that we have uh, within the Islamic Arab world uh, that is anti-Israel. And uh, Maurice Hirsch, we got uh, two issues to talk about today. First thing is you just showed me uh, a tweet put out by Palestinian Media Watch about 
uh, potential Flare. prisoners flare up within the Israeli prison system. And I, I, I asked you, I said, what is it? And I ask you again now, what, what do, when prisoners strike, when prisoners want to uh, fight against their imprisoners, uh, what can they do, what do they do, and, and how do you stop them from doing it? So the prisoners really have a, a, a wide spectrum of, of measures that they, can, that they can invoke, starting with basic violence, really taking their mattresses, taking their blankets and burning them. They know that eventually will, will replace everything, so they don't mind burning everything, burning the cells in which they sleep, um, burning the, the, the ping-pong tables that they use, the books that they read. Um, so that's the basic level. The, the next level really is physical violence and, and planning attacks against the guards. Um, that we've also seen in the past. Um, and then the, 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 there's their personal acts of what they call defiance. It's stupidity, but they call it defiance. And that's hunger strikes. What do you do when a prisoner goes on hunger strike? So in Israel, uh, uh, um, we unfortunately have a history of giving in to the hunger strikers when they're terrorists and letting them go. Um, but really, uh, um, almost seven years letting ago... Letting them go what, free? Letting them go free. Letting them go free. Um, um, it's like it's like the guy is in jail because he committed violence. Now he's threatening with violence against himself, and now I'm going to give into it. That doesn't make sense. And I can hear. Sure. And just before you answer, I just want to say I, I hear the collective groan of my listeners saying, "Just let him starve." You know, I, and I don't mean that in a harsh way, like they should all die. But like, if you're a terrorist and you've been convicted of violent crime, and you're now doing another violent crime, what am I supposed to keep stopping you? Go ahead, do a violent crime against yourself. How do you answer that? So, so those who have been released weren't, uh, weren't convicted terrorists, but rather terrorists being held in administrative detention, um, which in and of itself is a, is, a, is a measure that has not a small amount of problems um, and, 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 and really complexities. Um, so the, the, the choice has always been made to allow them to go free, especially when terrorist organizations, the terrorist organizations that they came from, threatened the, the, to fire missiles at Israel's civilian population if the, those terrorists die in jail. So by, really, by letting them die... Um, but isn't that just terrorism yet again? It, it, of course it's terrorism, but by letting them die, we are uh, uh, um, indirectly possibly uh, um, endangering the lives of, uh, of, of Israelis. Whereas on the other hand, they've been released at the stage where they've been 60 and 70 and 80 and 90 and 100 days on hunger strike. These people are really a sack of bones. Um, and their personal uh, uh, danger that they pose is already much limited from that. Um, well, you, you so, start eating again, you get back to yourself now. Well, so so you, 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 you generally get back relatively quickly. Uh, uh, um, you gain weight back. But to gain full function back, hunger striking for that period of time, it often causes not small and sometimes irreparable damage to the body. Mm -hmm. um, so we have seen terrorists coming back time after time and hunger striking time after time. But in many cases, we haven't seen those hunger strikers going back to terrorism and, and, and back into jail. All right, um, so how do you deal with hunger strikers? Okay, uh, like, you know, again, for me, I, you know, I, I, can, I still am not sure that I'm convinced by your argument that uh, hunger strikers should be, you know, that, that, that they pose a threat. Because in the end, the, the threats are, you know, the, the threats will always come from, from, from one quarter or another uh, with terrorists. And I thought we we're not supposed to negotiate with them. But okay, but you have a different perspective. How do you deal in your mind with, uh, with terror hunger strikers? So what Israel did already in uh, 2015 was to pass a, 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 an amendment to the prisons law which allowed the, uh, the prison service to force feed the hunger strikers in a case where their death would pose a danger to public security and the security of Israel, exactly what I described before. If their death would lead to the firing of missiles, then we won't let you go, but we're going to tie you down and force feed you. Um, that was the solution that we found. And force in, feed in doesn't mean you feed them with food. It means you, no, you, you give them an IV. IV. You, put a, you hold them down and you put an IV with, a, with minerals and liquids uh, uh, um, and salt into their body. And, 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 and that's it. You're not sticking a tube down their throat. Right. Uh, you're not trying to like, fatten up a, a goose here. Right. Uh, uh, um, that's not the idea. So, so that's the capability that we have. Sadly, even though the law was, was approved even by Israel's Supreme Court, and, and, and that isn't shocking because the idea of force feeding, uh, hunger striking prisoners is something which is used uh, in, in many different countries around the world. We're not unique in that situation. We're not unique in the position of having uh, uh, hunger striking uh, uh, prisoners. 
we are unfortunately unique in the fact that we never use the means and the measures that we actually fought to pass in legislation that the, and that the Supreme Court uh, um, actually approved. And instead, we just revert to releasing the terrorists instead. Um, so I want to tell you that, that I'm, um, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, but I've noticed that from time to time, I'm not sure exactly I agree with that particular thing. I agree with a lot of what you do. I'm a big fan of your work. But I'm not certain I agree with you because I feel, on the other hand, maybe if you let them die, then be, they'll see that that is not a useful tactic. Okay, they'll shoot missiles that one time. And, but like, be like, no, that is not, we don't succumb to that terrorism. Uh, d- d- don't don't for, 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 a, for a minute confuse what my personal opinion right. is right. with what I- I- Israel does. I would... I advocated uh, uh, actively for the death sentence to be uh, uh, used more often. I would lock any hunger striking prisoner in a cell with only one window and do a barbecue every single hour of the day outside of, his, outside of that window. Let him enjoy the great smell of, 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 that, of the barbecuing meat and, and just let him suffer until he says, oh, please give me, <laughs> please give me a lamb chop. Um, no, and, I would just throw, throw them into the... Throw them into the, into the cell with him. That's fine. That's right. Okay. Well, you that well, you you give me a great uh, 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 transition into the next issue, which is you said that you have advocated for laws of the death penalty. In fact, today I want to wish you a congratulations because today one of the laws that you are co-author on. Author, co-author. No, author. Okay, well, one of the people. Said on authors. Right? That's right. The, well, uh, you you have propes- propelled forward for a long time. Right, to right. today um, has been is going into first reading. Tell us about this law uh, in Israel. We go through three readings. Uh, it goes to first reading, then to committee, and then second and third reading. Tell us a little bit about the law that you are proposing. So, as part of the the, the Palestinian Authority's pay for slay policy, where they pay cash rewards to terrorists in prison. Um, they pay an additional bonus to Israelis, Israeli Arabs who are involved in terrorism. If you're a citizen of Israel, you get your basic salary from the PA, plus an extra addition of 500 shekel. If you're just a resident, then you get a, a bonus of 300 shekel. Um, in that manner, the Palestinian Authority directly incentivizes Israeli Arabs to participate in Palestinian terrorism against Israel, right? So, uh, um, so once we'd seen that program and we realized that this is a, a, a really a tremendous financial incentive um, for terror, we, th- we sat and thought, how, a Palestinian watch, how do we neutralize really entirely that incentive? And what we came up with was, was an idea like this. The Palestinian Authority sees the terrorists as their soldiers, The the terrorists themselves, including the Israeli Arabs, see themselves as soldiers of the Palestinians. When those terrorists request payment from the Palestinian Authority as a reward for their act of terrorism, what they're really saying is, please recognize me as your soldier. And when the Palestinian Authority pays them the salaries and pays them the bonuses, they say, you know what, we recognize you as our soldier. So if you're a soldier of a foreign and hostile army, then you, then you are seen to, as someone who has waived their right to Israeli citizenship or Israeli residency. There are, just to, uh, to, to tell the story, there are 12 different countries in Europe where just joining a foreign army, not necessarily a hostile foreign army, is sufficient basis for canceling citizenship. So here it's a, it's a no-brainer. You no, have, you're not just joining a foreign army. That's an active army fighting against your country. And you actively and, fought on right, their behalf. Right. So, so, so obviously it's a no-brainer that you're going to lose your citizenship. Um, and so we initiated a, 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 a we, 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 we put together, wrote and initiated the, the law uh, um, just over two years ago. Um, it was initially adopted uh, um, by the trailblazer as he is, Avi Dichter, uh, the member of Kresset and now the minister. Um, thereafter by Orit Struk, also trailblazer and, uh, uh, and, and now a minister. Um, and then uh, under the government of Naftali Bennett, uh, um, the minister uh, uh, at the time of, of the interior, Ayala Chaked, said it was a great law, it's a law that should pass, but with her Arab coalition partners, obviously there was no way that was going to pass. Um, and so for a year and a half they did nothing ag- about it, they just voted against it. Um, and now in just a few weeks since elections, uh, um, um, 
the uh, uh, the law was adopted by uh, uh, by a member of Knesset Ophir Katz, who's now the head of the coalition, and 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 bulldozing forward. Um, there are now 106 Chavrei Knesset who have expressed uh, uh, who are their parties have expressed uh, uh, um, support for the law. Um, the only three parties that didn't uh, uh, access support were the two Arab parties and the Labour Party. The Labour Party were hearing to were waiting to hear what the recommendation of the of the Shabak was, and the Shabak last week said, "Well, we're obviously clearly in favour of this, so we expect the Labour Party to join. So we expect to see every one of the of the non-Arab uh, Israel-hating uh, parties uh, um, to to support the law, and potentially we'll have a law that will pass." Um, with 110 people uh, supporting against just the votes of the of the terror supporting uh, uh, Arab parties, there is really is a move towards uh, starting to recognize the enemy for what he is, and, and to take away citizenship or or uh, to to expel. There's there's these discussions right now, uh, kind of bringing it back to a basic sedition and treason type of thinking about people who are in your country who are against you, and within the realization that within our country there are no-go zones, there are serious jihadist elements, pockets, that have not, not only are they within our land, but even within our state, and within the protections of our state. And so the, the, this, this, this government is trying to come back to a kind of sense of plain sanity. Uh, just last topic uh, with you, Advocate Maurice Hirsch, uh, and now... Uh, Chief legal, chief legal advisor, head of legal strategies, head of legal strategies uh, at Palestinian Media Watch. Uh, we saw uh, four attacks uh, over the Shabbat weekend, um, four terrorist attacks, jihadist attacks. Uh, one of them, sadly, quite successful uh, in that uh, seven people were murdered. Uh, I spoke today with ultra-Orthodox Jews, and I said to them, you know, with everything, guys, the simple answer is you have to be armed. You have to be armed. You guys didn't have anybody armed, or so it, you know the killing kept going. Had you had somebody armed, somebody would have been injured, and the next person would have been saved, since you would have dealt with the situation. And people agreed with me. But uh, I, I, I have said, and I want to ask your opinion on this uh, from your from your perspective at Palestinian Media Watch. It's it's obvious to me that the jihadist elements are going to have to uh, react right now to a nationalist Israeli government with more attacks. Uh, do you see? Uh, some kind of intifada-ish type of uh, situation coming up. Uh, what do you foresee in the, next, in the near future in terms of violence? And do you think, I guess, uh, that the nationalist coalition that we have here will be able to, in time, overcome uh, this impulse? So, so what I think uh, um, is important to, to understand also about the jihadist attacks on, 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 on Shabbat is that they don't happen within a, va a vacuum. There isn't this idea of the lone wolf terrorist. All of these uh, 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 um, empty, uh, 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 really, excuses for terrorism um, have, no, have re really very little basis. What you have here is a constant system of, uh, uh, of, of incitement, of pumping Jewish uh, hatred of Jews by the Palestinian Authority, pumping that idea that we will, as they say clearly, Israel is a fleeting existence. We will destroy Israel. We will take back our land and they will no longer be here. They say it all the time. And, and so that feeds into this whole idea of, of incitement constantly, constantly, constantly. That's what they do. When, uh, uh, um, when the, uh, um, the Ministry of Religious Affairs in the PA um, sent out its directive to the imams in the mosques, what should they talk about on their Friday sermons before obviously before the attack they say talk about the martyrs in Janine these holy souls who who were murdered by the Jews and, and this by is the, the Zionist occupation army by the Zionist occupation army the, that hatred is there all the time mm -hmm. and so obviously that 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 is something that is happening irrespective of and this is a common mistake and and it's something which really the West is playing on, and definitely the West liberal Israel-hating uh, media is playing on. It's all because of the right-wing government. No, it's not. The Arabs hated us. 
six months ago. They hated us a year ago. They were trying to murder us then. They just got lucky now. It happened to be that they just got lucky now. That's just the way that it is. Uh, and the Lions then terror groups in Jenin didn't start under the right wing government. It started under the most left wing government that Israel has had in three decades with the, uh, the participation of, of an Arab party, of a, of a Muslim Brotherhood party in the coalition. That's when it started. And, and this idea that that Itamar ben Gvira, the right-wing uh, 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 minister and, and member of Knesset, he's the one who's responsible, that's just a lie. That is an excuse to go and murder Jews. That's right. And that has to be understood. And, and so what we now have to do is that entire system is moving forward anyway. The Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, 87 years old, 19th year of his first four-year term, is falling apart. The violence is going to happen. We need to be proactive and, and lead in what, in defining is what is going to be the existence. Not allow the terrorists to lead us by the nose. We need to make the decisions. We need to make the decision that the Palestinian Authority, for example, has ceased to exist. It ceased to exist when Gaza was taken by Hamas in 2007. It ceased to exist when Mahmoud Abbas failed to hold ever elections. It ceased to exist when the PLO really dominated and took over the PA. It doesn't exist anymore. They don't control even the areas in Judea and Samaria. We just have to accept that reality and to say to the world, this is the picture. It no longer exists. Not only that, they also incite violence. They incite terror. They incite hatred. They pay financial rewards to murder Jews. They are the equivalent, with, the ex with the, only the small exception of, of the gas chambers of the Third Reich. There, there, there is not much difference between them. Jews, they, 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 they portray as, in the same way, as insects, as, as animals that, that, that are destroying humanity. That's, a, that's their outlook. And so we have to like, take that proactive response and not response, proactive approach and say, we're going to define our own existence and not allow the terrorists to, to drag us into this third and fourth and tenth intifada. It's not an intifada, it's a terror war. We shouldn't allow that to happen. It's not good for us. But no less importantly, it's not good for the Palestinians. Tens of Palestinians, hundreds of Palestinians are dying at the moment because of their involvement of terror. We need to stop that. And allowing the Palestinian Authority to, to continue to exist is not going to achieve that goal. So we have uh, Nazi-like thinking, but we're not in the era of the Holocaust. We're in the area of Jewish empowerment. God has given us the opportunity to have a state and to have the ability to push back. God has given us strength in an army, in a police, in the security services uh, that can push back on these things and not allow that ideology to spread. Uh, and... Um, we're going to do it. This government is the, the will of the people to indeed push back uh, on these forces that want to destroy us. And it's time to get back to, to sanity. Uh, Maurice Hirsch, advocate, uh, director of uh, legal strategy for Palestinian Media Watch. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks very much for having me. Don't worry. The Ishai Fleischer show will be right back. So stay tuned. This is a moment in Jewish history. This past month marked the 100th anniversary of the passing of Eliezer ben Yehuda, founder of modern Hebrew. He was the author of the first Hebrew dictionary, founder of the Committee of the Hebrew Language, and foremost figure in the efforts to revive what was thought to be a dead language. Born in 1858 in the Russian Empire to a Chabad Hasidic family, Ben Yehuda joined the growing number of young Jews eager for a renaissance in Jewish culture centered around their ancestral homeland. But with the actual moving to the land of Israel came the question of what language these dispersed Jewish people would speak. In April of 1879, he published an article in which he called for Hebrew to be the common language for the yet-to-be-created independent Jewish state. 
it was not without opposition. Some felt that because it was an uncommon language, it would not be suitable for communicating with the other Jewish people or with other nations in conducting commerce or other issues. Others felt Hebrew should be reserved only for prayers. Yet Ben Yehuda was not deterred. He set a personal example by informing his wife and child that they would speak only Hebrew at home. His son Itamar ben Yehuda went on to be called Itamar ben Avi, the first Hebrew child. Ben Yehuda wrote textbooks for what he called the Hebrew in Hebrew program. Schools in the land of Israel slowly began teaching classes in Hebrew. Ben Yehuda and his team began the task of modernizing Hebrew by creating and adapting words that did not exist in the times of the Bible. Although many words did exist and were able to be used, things like kitchen utensils or other household objects had to be created based on existing Hebrew terms. It was Ben Yehuda who devised the bulk of this work. He spent years working on what eventually would be called the Ben Yehuda Dictionary, a 17-volume set that was not fully completed until after his passing. Ben Yehuda was even imprisoned by the Ottoman authorities for his efforts. They accused him of attempting to incite rebellion. Ben Yehuda's beloved first wife was Devorah Jonas, the daughter of a Jewish businessman. The young Eliezer went to her father's house for help studying for university entrance exams. It was there he met Devorah, who tutored him in Russian and French. Devorah was devoted to the bright young students and they fell in love. After marriage, they had five children together. Eliezer suffered from tuberculosis, and Devorah devotedly took care of him. Unfortunately, in doing so, she too contracted the disease and passed away. As the story goes, it was her wish that Eliezer carry on the family and his important work in disseminating Hebrew, and Eliezer then married her sister, Hemda. For the next thirty years, Eliezer and Hemda became partners in not only raising the first Hebrew-speaking family, but in reviving the Hebrew language. Together, they bore six more children. She accompanied her husband on his travels to libraries and archives and met with American and European leaders. She spoke at events and gatherings about her belief that, quote, if we have a language, we shall become a nation. Hemda ben Yehuda wrote several books and a newspaper column called Letters from Jerusalem. Eliezer ben Yehuda died in December of 1922. He was buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. His funeral was attended by over 30,000 people. Today, thanks to his contribution, the Israeli people have indeed been united in the Hebrew language in an independent state. Israel's first Nobel Prize was given in literature to S.Y. Agnon, who wrote in Hebrew. There are now countless books, plays, films, poems, and more written in Hebrew. Doctors and scientists speak and write about the latest technology in the language originally spoken by the prophets of the Bible, using modern terminology developed by Eliezer ben Yehuda. Ben Yehuda wrote in his memoirs, I fell in love with the Hebrew tongue as a living language. This love was a great and all-consuming fire that the torrent of life could not extinguish. And it was the love of Hebrew that saved me from the danger which awaited me on the next step of my new life. This has been a Moment in Jewish History brought to you by Ben Bresky. To reach me, you can email bbresky at gmail.com. That's B-B-R-E-S-K-Y at gmail.com. All right, everybody. Shalom and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show. And we are indeed live, which is a little bit surprising, given that there is some serious rain out there in the land of Israel. And uh, at least in these parts, uh, the Internet and electricity tends to have uh, tends to go on and off and wreak havoc on the on the you know regular regular broadcasts uh, because of this rain. But so far so good, and I'm not alone. I'm joined by Rav Mike Foy. Rav Mike, shalom and welcome to the show. Oh, shalom, Isha. How are you doing? It's good to see you. I'm doing great. I'm a little bit wet. I was outside for a few minutes, and it is raining, raining, raining. 
And uh, it's it's interesting. We had here in Israel a um, batsoret, we call it, a, a drought. We had we had a summer like that was not rain, a winter that was not raining. It felt like summer, and it it was just like it was just it was just like really sunny and warm, and it was just like there is no winter. And suddenly there was this heinous Friday night attack against Jews. Seven Jews murdered. There were three other attacks that same day. Uh, there is a, a a man, a young officer who's fighting for his life right now in the hospital. Uh, from uh, gunshots to the to the stomach, he actually shot back and and stopped the aggressor, but uh, the terrorist. Uh, but there was this, like seven people were killed, and there hadn't been such a horrific, uh, uh, successful, sadly, attack against Jews uh, in a long time. The minute that was over, uh, like Sunday came and the clouds came, and you know you could you could you know winter came back strong suddenly, and it seems like there's going to be rain in the, for the foreseeable future which is a good thing. And I've been teaching all kinds of media that, that this is actually a good thing. But I thought to myself, could it be that either either these these people that were murdered, these Jews, were some kind of like korban, some kind of expiation, uh, and then the rains came, the blessings, uh, or conversely, uh, that God felt that, that it was such a harsh, harsh strike against us that he needed to comfort us? And comfort us with the rain. The Talmud says uh, has a whole litany list of um, of of gadol yom akshamim. How 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 important, how how uh, how how monumental and powerful uh, the day of the rains is. And that's that's where we're at. We're at the day of the rains. You can see the land is soaking it up. It's it's amazing sometimes to see these rivulets in the land of Israel. So powerful uh, and. Um, yeah, so I, so I'm a little bit wet from these rains, and and I wanted to ask you, what do you think about my, you know, my my thought here that that somehow somehow the the the, the murder and the death of these seven Jews somehow is related to this rain that came right afterwards? Uh, listen, that that level of analysis is beyond my pay grade. That lies with God, and I'm very hesitant to say anything other than that uh, Shem should give us a kapara and should revenge their blood. What I will point out is that it's also not long ago that we began to pray for the special prayer that's inserted into into the uh, main prayers um, for the sake of the rain. And I would prefer to think that maybe, you know, like when the, it says in the second paragraph of, of the Shema, that, that when we do what God asks, then the, the rains fall and the, and the land will grow. That, that maybe it was a little bit of a hitorut, a little bit of an awakening of people realizing for all the technological sophistication of our society and all the sense of control that humanity has gained over our environment, we need the rain, right? We can't live without the rain. And, um, you know, I have a thing about weather forecasting. We've discussed it. I, I remember, I remember it often. I, I, you, I, you I said we, you, you don't like the prognostication. Well, it's, uh, it's, of it's, weather. A of it's like a little bit of Odazara. When people tell you, it's going to rain tomorrow. No, it is. Yeah, you, know, you laugh and you smile. My kids actually, one of my kids actually told one of his teachers. <laughs> my dad said that predicting the weather is a Vodazar. His teacher was like, I don't think so. I was like, I didn't mean it was really a Vodazar. But 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 um why am I saying it now? It's because I, I think on some level the, the message to me is clear is that that if you're gonna hold fast to something, hold fast to prayer. You can hope, you can plan. You can estimate that it's likely to happen. I'm not den- I'm not a science denier. Um, but at the same time, if you want to be certain about something, there's only one thing you can really be certain about. And that's that God rolls the rule. And then explaining why things happen, I that's, that's above me. But 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 even in tragic times as these, it's very important, actually, even all the more so in tragic times as these, it's very important to attach ourselves to that basic truth that God rules the world. That we still have agency. But that we're junior partners in creation, and sometimes our task is to receive even the evil, and uh, do with it what we can. So that uh, your answer brings me uh, and my prelude to the Torah part of our conversation fits right in, which is I wanted to talk about uh, two things today, which is the man, or no, Haman and the Haman. mana, right? Haman and the mana, uh, and that's what I titled the show. Mana mana. Um, yeah, Hamana Mana, that's right, or Mana Chama. Um, I wanted to talk about these two things. And uh, before I do, and I'll make that connection, I just want to say hi to the folks that are saying hi to us. We got Steve. 
says, Shalom, Rav Yishai and Rav Mike. God willing, I'll be in the land next Thursday, landing on my Hebrew birthday. All right, so we look, forward, we look forward to seeing you. And Andrew says, uh, uh, rains are tokens of Hashem's forgiveness in the, the book of Yoel. And Chris asks, forgive my ignorance, but is there a drought there? And if so, how long has it been? It was a very dry winter. It's been a dry, it very dry winter. I don't right, know that we dry crossed winter. the full line to drought. Right. But, but, it, was a, but it was a dry winter. And right. of this course, is not over yet. This one rain does not a winter make. But according to those people who may be looking at the, at the uh, weather prognostication, and only if God wills it, it's supposed to continue to rain. That's all. I don't okay. know. It might, it might. We hope that God wills it. Please, God. And uh, our producer, when we're live, Lou, says, Shalom, Yishai, and Rav Mike, looking and sounding great. Let us know if the audio is equalized. I continue to be upset at the <laughs> fact that modern technology has not let us know. You have issues what, with what, equity? I just want to know what are the relative volumes. I would like to see on the, a little bar that says you're to just, me, you're this just is seeking equality out of a world which isn't going to give it to you, Yishai. No, I'm sorry. No. Well, speaking you can, of that. You can let all those folks out there know that. We have uh, uh, Ivo says Shalom from Croatia, uh, shalom. and uh, Kasahun says Shalom, and there's another gentleman here. Oh, the same. Oh, no, another gentleman, Priyom Priyom. He says, he says both. I want to go to the Israel, and then he says, he says, I am not happy with my religion. Well. <laughs> Neither am I, but that's very Jewish. <laughs> not, Who said you were supposed to be happy? God I'm never not. said you were supposed to be happy. Yeah, we don't. We don't have a religion. We have a. We have a Torah and a faith. We, and and so, you know, if anything. And, the religion is a little bit confining, but the Torah is right. Great. That's right. And and you can and you can you know you're allowed to uh, kvetch. You're allowed to kvetch, and you're allowed to. Uh, and you're your allowed favorite to, kvetch. Your favorite kvetch is in this week's parsha. There, there are many questions. Which question are you referring to? Mati uh, there, were, yeah, there were no graves in Egypt. You that's right. Take us that's all right. the way to the sea to die. <laughs> that was the moment of, of Jewish, of Jewish, uh, real ironic humor. Jackie, Jackie Mason's soul right. came into the world. In the yes, moment. every yeah, Jackie Mason and Mel Brooks and, and and even what's his name and even Seinfeld. The whole thing. I could see Seinfeld being there. I could totally see Seinfeld at the sea. Seinfeld at the Sea. I could see that. I could call the show Seinfeld at the see, Sea. I could see Woody Allen. Yeah, Woody Allen. I could see Seinfeld being like, what? There was no... I can't do his voice, but like, what? There were no graves in Egypt? You know, I could so see him just being there, being that guy. <laughs> um, but uh, but indeed, indeed, that, that's in this week's short portion. But I want to focus a little bit right now on the mana. I, want, we, okay. I don't think we've in the past discussed the mana. So we just talked about rain. And the mana is related to to um, meteorological me, me, not meteorological yeah like uh, weather it's 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 related to precipitation especially more to frost and snow there's a lot of relationship dew. between that dew but also frost for it's got a few different places where where it kind of lays out that it was like a white type of you well, know, it's got a rain connection too because it's mamtir lachem lachem you know that's right right. So there's something about it, and then there's something about uh, there's something about the mana, which is like, it's like rain, it's like dew, it's like snow. It comes from the heaven. God provides it for you. You wake up in the morning, and there it is, um, and you pray for it. And then there's a connection between that and welfare, and making a living, and God, uh, God, you know, supplying your needs. Um, and this week's Torah portion has this whole story about the mana, and the mana is this heavenly bread. And and you're supposed to eat it. It's it, 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 it's exactly what you deserve, and it's exactly what you need. No more, no less. To, no more, no less. To the point that, you, but 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 the sages kind of tell us, well, if you were really righteous, it just showed up right at your doorstep. But if you were a little less righteous, you gotta had to walk a little Schlepp, bit to, 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 to get it. it. That's right. And you couldn't take more than you needed. And if you did, it would it would kind of like you know rot, and especially if you if you try to take it and keep if you try to uh, you know uh, hoard hoard it and leave it till morning. God's like no 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 no. It's not like it that. Work that way, right? This is this is not. It's not exactly capitalism. It's more like I'm going to give you what you need from each you. according to their ability to each according to their need. Dare right. I say? Yeah, but but it's God who got Marx in our parsha. We That's got right. we got we got Jackie Mason in our parsha. More do you need? Yeah, we got we got, got them all. Jews. We got them all. 
Um, and so I wanted to ask you about the mana now. And uh, one last one last thought about the mana, which is it 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 a, a certain portion of it was put in a jar and was saved inside the tent of meeting, inside the ark, or maybe next to the ark. There's some differences. There's some dis- some disagreement where exactly was it was maintained. Most people say it was within the ark. I think. Is that right? Most people agree that it was like it was it had a little shelf in the ark. I think there was. There, that's what I. That's what I learned. Um, no, it wasn't like that. I think it's Machloket, like you said. I don't know if it's right. Yeah. But, and anyway, whatever it is, it was it was kept so you would see it yep. when it no longer showed up. You'd be like, "Oh my God, there's the mana." You had to see it sometimes. It was it would be kept in the holy of holies, but it was on display. It was like a museum piece. God, this is like I think I think it's the first museum piece because God's like keep this and show it to people and show it. Yeah, keep I mean, and show it. And the question becomes why, and I think that goes to the heart of of the message that God gives with the man. I mean, God says, "I'm going to rain down bread from heaven." Everybody's going to go out and get their daily portion. Right, in order to test, are they going to hold by my Torah or not? And this is this opens up a very sort of significant element of the divine relationship, which is relevant down to our day. Which is how much do you believe that what what you have comes to you from God, and how much do you believe that it comes to you through your own agency? Mm-hmm. Right, this is a very big challenge because on one hand, you know, the Torah teaches us that we should do hishtadlut. We need to make effort in life. We're partners with God. In all aspects of creation, you can't just sit on your tush and do nothing and God's going to give to you. On the other hand, the, the ultimate sin in relationship to God is It was the power of my hand and my own strength that brought me all this wealth and power. So, so the man is a test. It's how it's presented. Are you able to be satisfied with what I give you today? And do you have the faith that, that tomorrow will take care of itself? Right. I mean, I can tell you this, someone who, who uh, is independently employed. I'm sure I've told you before that when I first went out on my own, one of my friends who was also independently employed said to me, listen, just remember, there'll either be nothing to eat or no time to eat it. You choose. Right? <laughs> so the man is the exact opposite. It's God saying, no, there will always be enough to eat, but, but only enough. And if you try and you scramble and you worry and you – that's not going to change anything other than your experience. Or hoard. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I say that. I was just in America, uh, and you know, God bless America. It's it's doing fine in many ways. It's got some issues, some some hiccups. There we all. But it's still it's still you know it's still a fabulous country. And um, you know, um, when you're there, there's a lot of plenty. Oh, I developed a line. You, you, Rev. Mike, you're gonna love this. I'll tell you why. Well, I've developed one simple line. I've said this to a few people, and everybody was like. Wow, you're right. I said one of the problems in this world is prosperity without purpose. Sure. Prosperity without purpose. Yeah. And there's a lot of prosperity yeah. there now. Now, now sometimes when you're in so prosperity, prosperity mode, 19th century literature. Go ahead. No, no, I mean it's just I mean you see it across the board. As soon as the wealth began to accumulate amongst the uh the leisure class, you know, the whole theory of the leisure class is like, whoa, what? What, what do we now do with our lives? This, right. It's definitely one of the illnesses that Western society suffers right. from right now. Right. So, 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 what, one of the things that that we um, we can get really into stuff, and 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 boys have toys these days, and it's like technology. I need this computer. I need this thing. I get into it myself, and I have to. I have to. Sometimes I just have to say to myself. I mean, I've said it my, to myself this week a few times, which is like, no, 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 no. Don't buy anything. Don't try to get anything. The things that you have is fine. Make do. And when those things, you know, get ruined or whatever it is, or they the time is done, right? Whatever, whatever that thing is, get it then. You don't need the shoes. You don't need to hoard a shoes. You don't need to hoard another computer. You don't need you don't need that stuff like like whatever Hashem gives you at the time, that's what you need. That's what's good. And when it's finished, then then you'll then Hashem will provide the next thing. It's like a mono way of thinking. Um, so how do you how do you balance? I guess here's my question: How do you balance between the mana way of thinking and between well, we could call it Western, you know, uh, 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 um, sensibilities, or maybe 
just uh, lizard brain sensibilities, right? The lizard brain wants to have stuff in the cave when the rains to come. To feel safe. To feel yeah. safe. Yeah. Yeah. I feel and like that, I feel like when it's raining outside, you're like, oh, I gotta buy more stuff. I never feel that way. I have a poorly okay. developed acquisitive instinct. It's it, it's problematic <laughs> when I need when I need something. And like I need help to buy things. I know that may sound nice, but it's really no. Nice. My mom is like that also. Doesn't like to buy stuff. Um, hates buying stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like I need help anyway. But you know what I'll tell you is that um, I think that if we want the answer, it's not surprising that we have to go back to Bray Sheet. Mm-hmm. We go back to the beginning of Genesis, and remember, remember that that Adam was created of the Ula Shoma. He was created to 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 work and to to preserve the land. Is that is that me blinking out or you? Did you see me? I see you, great. Right. Okay, um, to work and preserve, and and and, and avodah, of course, also means not just work, but to serve. Meaning, it's not just of the lishamra. The avodah itself means to serve, and I think that's the best way to make the distinction: is that everything we should do should be in service of. And if it's in service of ourselves, we better be very careful. Mm. Not that, not that, not that it's completely pasul. Not, not that 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 doing things in service of yourself is intrinsically wrong. I think it's important to take care of yourself, and even you know, uh, even sometimes you know, have a little fun and, and give yourself a reward. Fine, I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. But it it, it should be very clear. Even that, even those rewards, though, even those rewards uh, should be anchored in a sense of service and a sense of the other seeing you and and. Even even if it's for rest, it should be rest so that you can get back to service. Even if it's vacation, it's to, to see God's beautiful things and to get yourself back. And I saw this in the Rambam. The Rambam says very clearly, like, you have to keep yourself healthy. And, and if you need to go out, what they call in Hebrew, in the deshe, if you need to air out, okay, good. That's, that's healthiness, but that's, again, in service to keep this body going well so that you can continue your path of serving God in this world. So that, I mean, that's how I think I would make the distinction. Is that making sure that your labors are always an act of service? Mm-hmm. Purchases included. Right. That's that's definitely right. In fact, sometimes when I'm when I'm in the right mood, when I'm in the right mental place, I really ask Hashem, I'm like, please help me take for if I'm in America, help me buy the thing that I need to to do your thing in the Holy Land. Like let me and then I say to the store, I look at the store and I go, Who's coming with me? <laughs> Who here wants to make Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael? Which one of you products? Which one of you wants to come with me and my luggage to the Holy Land? Now, the funny thing is, is all the clerks in the store are staring at this guy with the key on his head going, why on earth is he speaking to the suits? Listen, why is he speaking to them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of weird people out there, so I, I'm, I'm not I'm not the weirdest yeah. of them all. You know, I, I, Certainly you not. Know, especially if you come in, you know, dress nicely, they're like, he's probably oh. not a shoplifter or a killer. Uh, so I try to I try to give off that uh, the feeling that uh, non shoplifting murder that, vibe. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm smiling <laughs> at people, but uh, you know. And by the way, I was telling some uh, some uh, good Jews that I was speaking with from Atlanta. I told them, you know, I want you to know that in my mind, fundraising is also aliyah. When I'm fundraising from somebody, I'm like, this guy, ma- this gal, this person doesn't want to make aliyah, maybe, but part of him does, and so his money, that is his blood, sweat, and tears, wants to come to the land of Israel. So come on with me. Come on to the good land. There's a part of you that's coming to the good land. I really believe that if you start thinking that way, you see a person, he's giving you his $100, that $100 wants to go to Israel, that's a part of him that wants to go to Israel. I'm willing to do that for anybody out there. You be in touch with me. I will take part of you to the land of Israel. That's right. You just, that's right. You just Amen. let go. That's right. That's right. And there are easy no ways. Part too big, no part too small. That's right. And in fact, this is a good time to plug uh, the fact that uh, you have uh, Rev Mike's spiritual counseling, uh, which is being used. Some of our listeners are indeed uh, told me uh, that they reached out to you and they need some help making some decisions and thinking, maybe even about that very thing that we're talking about, which is going to the good land, going home. So that's 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 definitely some special counseling, and that's found at RevMike.com and JewishStory.co. Uh, right. Both will lead you in the path of knowledge and a greater connectivity with the self and with the other, with Hashem, with God Almighty. Uh, so that's 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 there. Uh, and of course, uh, if you want to hear more information from me, all my writings and videos and radio, it's at ishaifleischer.com, including uh, support that's easy through just buying a cup of coffee, a, a virtual cup, digital cup of coffee, which is at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. Very easy, very fun. Okay, so we talked about the uh, the bread 
the 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 the, the um, what would you call the, the mana? What would you like to call it? It's bread. This what it says. Bread from heaven. Right. What, what bread else? from the heaven. What are you going to call it? It's your divine well, portion. It's divine portion. Good. I like that. See, there you go. Good. It's also it's also a bread of, of faith. I think yeah. we a little bit allude to it also with the matzah. Right. Uh, uh, that there's a. There's I mean, a, it's there's an explicit there's an explicit reference to it every Shabbat. One of the reasons that we, we that we cover the challah on Shabbat and, and really traditionally it says you're supposed to have a mapa below and a mapa above. There should be a cloth below it and above it. Is because when the man came down, there was a layer of dew, and then the man fell, and then another layer of dew. And so Midr says it was kemunach bekufsa. It was like it was put inside a box. And so there's a whole recognition that that the, all the plenty of the week really comes to us through Shabbat. Rashi mm-hmm. even says that the original bracha of Shabbat, back on the seventh day of creation, when it says God blessed it, God blessed it with man. But of course, the trick is, did, did the man fall on Shabbat? No. No, so that's the trick. That's the blessing, is knowing that you have enough. Which is, of course, that sense of sovav, uh, of, of satisfaction, is, is the greatest blessing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that also, by the way, that's another issue about eating, which is um, can we extract more from the very food that we eat by chewing slower, by being more mindful, by trying to release more of the energy that's stored within food, the spiritual energy, and basically digesting it spiritually better and therefore kind of getting more 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 spiritual power out of the food, releasing the spirit, the, the whatever energies need to be released, and breaking it down in a more, uh, what's the word, the, what do they call it, uh, more efficient, in a more efi- spiritually efficient way. I mean, Making physically speaking even. We right. waste an enormous amount of food that we even eat, much less what we don't. Right, but when you but when you're mindful about eating, and you do, and so I I call this the 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 uh, uh, what did I I gave it a name, but I forgot now. Which is like 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 um, when you make spiritual eating, and and a thing I do sometimes it's rare and it's hard. You cannot do it for more than a few bites, and if you can, let me know if you could do it. But basically, for example, my wife served us some corn tonight. So if you can, if you can imagine uh, the corn and where it came from and how many trucks and things it take, took to get to you, and then you can imagine that corn growing it, and you can imagine that the sun from you know, millions of miles away is radiating its, its energy on it, and you can imagine the water from the heavens, and you can imagine the farmer. And then if you could go deeper and imagine its genetic a makeup and how it grew and the, and the stuff that it took out of the soil. And then you imagine the earth and you really do all the stuff and you imagine that God really created all of this for you to this moment, eat this piece of corn so that you can, you can extract the energy from this corn to continue to do the service of God. And you do that with every bite and you do like the, like, like a, a think God for your, your eating is like totally different. You're like, Whoa. And it is it, very powerful. And you, you lose weight and you look great. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and but, meals take significantly longer. Yeah, they took a lot longer, and I like I, I can't do it for more than like five minutes, really. But like, if you can do it, if you can do it, and just really, I mean, if you do it really for five minutes, the rest of your meal is like in a different place. I believe. But it. you really have to like, you really have to meditate on every chewing and everything, and you're like, it's it's a it's a it's like a. Yeah, I, I came up with it. I forgot the name. If you want to come up with a name, write me an email, yishaiyishaifleisher.com, the spiritual kosher diet, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> the, the mana the diet, let's call it. The meditative chew. Medita- that's right. That's right. Chews for Jews? That's <laughs> – Sorry. We're going to stop now. It's, it's late. <laughs> so now, now um, it's, it's not a coincidence that there is another Haman – uh, which is Haman. In Hebrew, the mana is man or haman, the man. And there's another haman. And I'm not the first to point out at all. In fact, I heard about it years ago about uh, the Ben Ishchai. That the Ben Ishchai talked about the fact that the haman, these are both related concepts. One is this bread of faith. And one comes when you have lack of faith, and it's Haman or haman, or it's the Amalekites, the anti-Jewish energy, the bizarro energy, that the world is... The, the, the world is meaningless. It's the uh, ultimate uh, in nihilism. It's nihilism all the way to the core. 
It's real nihilism. Um, it's even beyond like self gratification. It's like a, it's like a nihilism that's like it's deconstruction. Is- it's an activist stance against meaning. Meaning, because uh, the sort of the the, the pleasure seeking dissipating energy just doesn't care. But all it cares, they care to destroy all meaning. Right? It's it's an it's an activist stance against. Right? Uh, hence the fact that we have a war. We don't have a war with hedonism. Hedonism is a human stance, which you know it, it isn't going to take you anywhere good, but. But we don't have an essential war with it. We just stand against it because we believe in, in you know, discipline, physical, spiritual, etc. But Amalek, there's an eternal war between God and Amalek. Why? Because Amalek is poised against, against our whole posture of meaning and faith. So that's right. And so Amalek hears that the Jewish people are released from Egypt. He was cool with us being in bondage. We're heading to the land of Israel. That's no good. That means great liberation and revelation of godliness. And they are they are very concerned about us coming with faith and with basically the biggest proof of God's existence, which is the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, as is promised by God. So they've got to go out there and stop it. And so they make war with the Jews. They make war with Israel. And here's what I wanted to ask you today about. I wanted to ask you about a specific episode there. Uh-huh. Moses, Moses's hands. Uh, Moses, the Torah tells us that when Moses's hands were held up, then the Jewish people would defeat Amalek. But when his hands would get tired, his hands would fall. So then, so then the Amalekites would be victorious or stronger. They would overcome the Jews to the point that basically uh, Aaron and Hur got up there with Moses in the mountaintop, sat him down on a rock, and held up his hands. And that is such a, such a, and, and this holding up of the hands is somehow the key to defeating uh, Amalekites. So I wanted to ask you about that. I'm not sure, you know, what am I supposed to take away from that? How am I supposed, like, is there a lesson there for me to learn? Like, what do, what do I need in my life? Moses holding up his hands. Do I need strong Jews to hold up Moses' hands? What does that mean? Where's the where's God in all this? Like, isn't he the, the like why what what's the what's the business of the hands holding shot? Up? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, first of all, it's important to note that of course you're not the first person to ask this question. The mission in Rosh Hashanah asks it, um, and and the classic answer that our sages give is that it has nothing to do with Moshe's hands per se. When he held his hands up, people looked heavenwards and they were mishabe libam v'avinu shushrayim, right? That they sort of subjugated their hearts to our to our Father in heaven. And that's definitely true. Far be it for me to argue with the sages. No, that's but fine. I offer you, but I want to offer you a, dif- a, 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 a different explanation. Dare I say, maybe a little bit deeper, but certainly connects to what you were saying about specifically Amalek's opposition to Israel to coming into the land. See, because we live in a world in which people think that the power of the spirit is abstract, right? Religion is an abstraction. You have powerful ideas. Ideas will change the world. And it's not that this isn't true, but the Greatness of the Jewish people is in our embodiment, right? Our task in the world is to take the the um, spiritual truths, which often float above, and to bring them into reality, into existence, with all the messiness and the imperfection that that's going to imply, because the physical world is what it is. And so, therefore, we see consistently, and that's, by the way, why Amalek was so concern of Israel getting into Egypt. If we had been determined to stay in the wilderness, eat manna all day and drink water from the well and and stay with the Mishkan, I think that they wouldn't have had such a problem. They knew yeah. where that we were headed. But 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 you can see consistently throughout the Tanakh that the prophets of Israel are doing what you might mistakenly call symbolic actions. Right? You want to defeat Aram, you're going to smash the 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 arrows into the ground. You know, you you you, you want to um Bring down fire from heaven. You have to roll the uh, the stones together to build the altar out of twelve stones, like the tribes of Israel. Moshe's hands have to actually physically be lifted up, not just because it's an, a symbol that inspires people to subjugate their hearts to God, which is also true, but because the primary message when fighting Amalek is that the world is not an abstraction; that the physical world is the divine plane; that mm-hmm. God created this world. 
for us to act within and that our job as Jews is to sanctify this world and to not give in to all the places where Amalek catches us because our lives aren't perfect. Our societies aren't, you know, you know, perfectly just and that's it. All those ways in which Amalek undermines, right, cools us down, right, as the Midrash says. You know, the end, it enters that element of cynicism, like, oh, you know, the Zionist project is an act of righteousness? What about the occupation? Listen, our military posture in Yudan Shamron, it's a mess. I would change it tomorrow, probably not in the way that the people who are against the occupation like, but I would definitely change it, right? Um those elements don't undermine the reality of the sanctity of what we're doing. It's we're actually striving to show people you can live holiness in the world. And that's why it was so important that Moshe not just teach them about God, but that he actually hold his hands up saying, you can reach heaven. And it's going to take, by the way, a lot of work. And you're likely to need some help doing it. And hence the fact that Hur and Aaron were part of that picture as well. I, I just I, I keep losing you there, Isha. You look like one of my students when I was teaching post high school. You shiver, your face is frozen, right? And as far as I know, you're actually sleeping and you're not listening to me at all. But uh, but I'm guessing actually you probably can't hear me even. This is my opportunity to tell all the juicy secrets. I know. Oh, oh he's back now. I'll stop. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, nah, no, nah, I was just joking. I couldn't tell you. Could you hear me that whole time or no? No, no, I didn't. Just ah, no, I just heard. I just told all the people everything I know about you. So. Like you'll have to listen to uh, later. But I, I very much like what you were saying. So that you're saying that like the, the, the Moses holding hands is like is like a proof that 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 the fight has to be in this world and in this with this physicality. And, and it's an I expression to... of it, it's not just a proof about something else. It is itself. That's why that's why it says Yide Moshe Emuna. Which is right. the first noun usage. That's the first time we get the word emuna. Right? Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. A, a, what does that mean? He's, his hands itself, as the as the, some of the commentators say, his their steadfastness in the face of the reality is that his arms got so heavy somebody had to help him. But his steadfastness in the face of physical reality, knowing that in the end that it's the vehicle for God's will, that is Imuna. Not some abstract belief which can't manifest in the world. That's not the Jewish definition of Imuna. Interesting, very interesting, and, and this is not the first time, by the way, that we see that and Moses' hands go up in the air. Sometimes, same thing when he came out of uh, the Egyptian castle, praying for uh, for Pharaoh. So he held his hands up to the heavens. Uh, so there are definitely God's times constantly telling him to stretch his hand out with the rod. And by the way, we also get the image that the Israel Yotzim Biyad Rama, right? That the Israel goes out of Egypt with a high hand. It's a very powerful biblical image. I'm willing to bet that if we looked into Egyptian, um, you know, hieroglyphic, you know, sort of records of that time period, we would find that that idea of lifting up your hand, right, has significance in their culture. Because remember, we're watching a direct cultural conflict here. We've That's been right. reading it now for three thousand plus years, and we're we're getting from it what God intended us to get from it. But again, in that whole idea of the embodied truth. The Torah was given to real people in a real place at a real time, right? And it needed to make sense to them in a way in which it would be ma- it would matter enough that they would go through everything they needed to go through in order to get it to us, right? So, so I, I will really bet on it that the that the, the lifted hands has some significance there in Egyptian culture that we're unaware of. So, elite writes, she writes, she, she writes that you need to be active to fight uh, the enemy, and that your people need. To help you, so yeah, she's saying, sure. I think exactly that, which is like you got to be, you got to be active, and the leadership has got to be there, and you know, yeah. and Aaron and Hur had to hold up. Well, she couldn't do it yeah. herself. That's right, that's right. Uh, and let's see, Linda says, uphold your belief, uphold leaders, uphold yourself in the only one who upholds you. So, um, um, th- that's another, I guess. That's another idea of this uh, hand holding, um, uh, hand holding up in the air, and okay, so that that is you know that is the other side. Now the the um, Ben Ishchai says that the word Haman is spelled with a hey, which if you spell out the letter hey, it's hey hey spells out hey, and mem, if you spell out the letter mem, it's mem mem, 
And nun, if you spell out the letter nun, is nun, nun. So Haman, there's something already in there, which is a duality. And he says this is because really it's, you, you have two options in this world. You either go with the man or you get Haman. It's like, that's basically it. Either you go full on faith and with God and, and whatever he gives you and, and, and how he walks you in a pathway. And yes, you lead him and yes, you are involved and, and yes, you raise your hands in, in action. But, because, but in any case, you are in the pathway of the mana bread. That's the general trend of your life. Or if you throw that off and you go to, to the party of Achashverosh and you throw off that the right food and you start eating the wrong food and you start going to the wrong path and the path of, of uh, placating man and uh, placating societies, well, don't be surprised if you go into the assimilation route that suddenly uh, you'll face a Haman who will bring you back and remind you about exactly what you're supposed to be going. And, and you know, and really in many ways, the line right before Amalek's appearance is, is exactly what this is saying, is that the question that triggers the first appearance of Amalek is, Hayesh Hashem Bikir right? Is God within us or not? And I mean, in the local context, it means like, is God with us? But 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 really, it means, is God within us? Like, is God out there somewhere? And, and, and we got to like spiritualize to get to God? Or no, can we like, just like the mana that we're eating, like, is, it, is there a sanctity that is here within us? If you don't choose that, you end up with Haman. Because then you get the nihilism and the, the, the physicality, which is detached from God and all the darkness that comes into the world with that. Amen. May we choose uh, the path of uh, the mana bread instead of the path of Haman. The path of Haman, at the end, by the way, brings you back to the path of the mana bread, right? It's it's a it's a correcting it's a corrective at the end it's a it, like anti semitism it's, it's not a way you want to go no you don't want to go that way you don't want to go that way but if it comes at you then then also you got to hear that as well and that's what we learn in the next Torah portion uh, is that the next Torah portion uh, but we learn in you Yitro know? that he's like he heard that the Amalekites struck at Israel and he was like that's also proof for God yeah and you see the hate they, that's and the where obsession. They Right when you see when you see that they're going crazy to try to stop you, that's also a sign that there's something holy and amazing happening here. Uh, there's something holy and amazing happening here on the show, Rav Mike Farr. I want to thank you very much. Wish you a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much Shabbat. for joining us. And again, I, I urge people to check out uh, RavMike.com and TheJewishStory.co uh, and continue to enjoy Rav Mike's other show as well, which is called The, the Jewish Story and his spiritual counseling work, which is uh, which is very powerful and useful and is available to you. So thank you very much, Rev. Mike, for joining us today. A pleasure as always. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, Shabbat Shalom to Rev. Mike Foyer. Thank you very much. And I want to say Shabbat Shalom to all of you out there. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to the show. Uh, this show is broadcast live right now via uh, various mediums, uh, but you can catch us on podcast on the Ishai Fleischer Show, the Israel Podcast. And we want to thank you, Chavit Seidman, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, uh, and Lou and Tabitha for getting our show out to the world. And we want to thank all the folks that make this show possible. Uh, if it's uh, our good friends at retrowatchguy.com, uh, check out this watch right here. I'm wearing it right now. This is a watch that I got from Retro Watch Guy. It's an awesome watch, uh, and it's a classic retro watch. It brings me back in time, but keeps time today. It's an awesome, awesome uh, way to to connect with uh, with 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 the cool stuff that they made in the sixties and seventies and bring it into today and, and have a f- fun man gift. Uh, we have our great uh, media partners at jewishpress.com with their wonderful email every single week. Uh, the Jewish express, excuse me, that emails every day, uh, the Jewish express and our new partner, which we're very proud of, which is JNS.org. And now we are part of their podcast uh, family as well. So these are both amazing websites that give you the basically the, the political truth and, and the, the real narrative of what you're supposed to understand about Israel. Throw away the other newspapers. Go to JewishPress.com. Go to JNS.org. I'm telling you, it'll change your life and understanding of Israel. Um, and so uh, as well, I recommend that you check out HebronFund.org, uh, the organization that supports the Jewish community of Hebron. Come to Hebron and the Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs, the Mamas and the Papas, and keep that place strong. Because when you keep that place strong, you are keeping the Jewish roots alive and strong. And the enemies want to take us down. We won't let them. With your help, 
hebronfund.org, including our great tours uh, with Rabbi Simcha Hachbaum, hebronfund.org. Uh, and of course, highonthehar.com. Uh, you can't miss the opportunity to go to the Temple Mount when you're here in the land of Israel. It would just be like, it would just be missing the heart of the heart. Don't miss the heart of the heart. Uh, come uh, come to the Temple Mount, uh, high on the Har, which Har means mountain. So it's uh, H-Y-I-G-H, uh, H-I-G-H, on the Har, H-A-R. Uh, they will take you up, and we are very proud that they uh, are partnered with our show uh, because that's being partnered with the highest thing of them all, which is connecting to God at his, at his abode. So that's high on the har. Uh, and of course, there's also the Israel Bible. Uh, you got to take it home with you. And that Israel Bible can live on your shelf and can make really a great impact on your life. Beautiful writing, beautiful text. Uh, check it out uh, on uh, theisraelbible.com and let uh, them know that you want to uh, you to use coupon code Yishai and get percentage points off there. So that's uh, the Israel Bible, an amazing and beautiful uh, uh, book and the Torah and knowledge of God's wisdom, beautifully wrapped up with translation and transliteration. So that's uh, theisraelbible.com and coupon code Yishai. Finally, uh, we've done a lot of spirituality, a lot of defense of the Jewish people, the Jewish narrative. At the end, you have to eat. So please check out our good friends uh, at prohibitionpickle.co.il, and you can uh, go to prohibition. That's prohibition, prohibition pickle. That co. That il. Great, get great kosher food. Send great kosher food. Make Shabbos fun. It's really, it's really something very special. And you could send it to your favorite show hosts or your favorite friends uh, anywhere in Israel, or get it, of course, for yourself if you're here. So that's uh, prohibition pickle. That co. That il. So that's about it, folks. Lots of folks are part of this great show, and we thank this great effort to make a show. You'll decide if it's a great show, uh, but we uh, do our best. And we thank Hashem God Almighty for giving us the opportunity to broadcast to you from the land of Israel. Even though we have some electric problems sometimes, we keep on trucking and God gives us the juice uh, to keep propelling His word, His vision, His ideas, and His blessings forward. So I bless you from the land of blessings. Stay tuned, stay strong, stay connected, and Shalom. Shalom.